Welcome. This is Jan Spencer in Eugene, Oregon. This evening's presentation is Transforming a Suburban Property. It's the first in a seven-part series, and you're welcome to join us for the remaining six presentations. First, a few acknowledgments. Thanks for Joshua and Helen helping out this evening, and also Hummingbird Wholesale in Eugene for funding the Zoom add-on. A shout out to Vadim, David, Alex, Amy, Nicola, Chuck, Mike, Skeeter, Wenatchee 350, Nan, and others who have helped put the word out about the seven-part Zoom presentations. Just a few words about myself. This is Jan Spencer. I've lived in Eugene, Oregon for 28 years. Born in New York, lived in Texas, Arkansas. I've been out of the country, low budget traveling for five years. I'm veggie for 45 years, surfed competitively. Spent a night in a South African jail. I'm way into bicycles. Currently, I'm a board member of my neighborhood association, and I produce almost all my own fruit and vegetables here on my property. I'd like to share the ideals of this series of presentations, and they go like this. To encourage picking up the pace for social, political, and economic transformation towards a society that lives within the boundaries of the natural world, an economic system that is honest, accountable, and serves the healthy goals of society, and the restoration of the natural world. The contents for this presentation. First, I'd like to look at just a little point of departure some of the basic ideas that are the foundation for the presentation and the entire series. I'd like to take a quick look at suburbia. Suburbia is just a fascinating history, and it's important to understand the connection of big business financial interests in the history of suburbia because those financial interests, that history of suburbia, has had an enormous impact on our culture, our economy, and the natural world we're totally dependent upon. We'll have a nice show-and-tell 20 years of transforming a suburban property, and then a quick look around my neighborhood and finally, a preview of the next six Zoom presentations in this series. Another quick item. While you're watching this presentation, you can always stop and pause the presentation to take a closer look at anything. And you might even consider a screen grab from your own computer. You're welcome to grab any image from a presentation. point of departure. Call these principles, call these observations. They're important. They're the foundation of all seven presentations. We live in one of history's most remarkable examples of social engineering, known as the consumer culture. Perhaps the most important product of market capitalism is the success it has had in degrading society's capacity to imagine and create social, economic, and political alternatives. Each front yard garden, each worker co-op, each downsized lifestyle point the way towards a preferred future. Point of Departure the ideal society exists within its environmental boundaries. The ideal society brings out the best and positive human potential. It embraces economic and political democracy, and the ideal society at this point 
restores the natural world. Principles for a preferred present and future. I look to the wisdom of the world's great spiritual traditions. You can't do any better than this. Care for the natural world. Modesty of lifestyle. Service to the community. Personal and society uplift. Responsibility for our own actions. I like making graphics, and this graphic shows the various keywords and concepts. We'll hear some of these in today's presentation, but all these topics, all these particular keywords and concepts populate the entire seven presentation series. Okay, early suburbia. Suburbia predates modern times by thousands of years. All through history, those who could afford it lived a bit further away from the, the congestion, sometimes unsanitary conditions, the crowding. Cities shouldn't be over-romanticized. They've been semi-gnarly places to live all through history. And for example, here in ancient Egypt, Let's just sort of imagine that boat arriving to this country estate. Somebody is just returning home from a day at the office. Transportation has an enormous impact on urban design. Many people would be surprised to know that the first modern commuting suburb predates automobiles by almost a hundred years. That first commuting suburb, some would consider to be Brooklyn, New York. When the steam ferry became dependable enough to have a schedule, a whole new world of business opportunity presented itself. Farms were turned into suburban subdivisions in 1830 in Brooklyn, New York. If you saw the the increase in population in Brooklyn in the early mid 19th century. Brooklyn was a boom town with real estate deals and skyrocketing suburban population. Each new transportation innovation had its own impact. The omnibus, which was invented in France, essentially an urban stagecoach, the horse trolley, the electric trolley, the automobile. Each new innovation allowed people to live further from where they worked and further from where they took care of their daily needs. To a large degree, suburbia is a make-work project. Federal housing policy in the late 30s was designed to create employment the construction industry was hard hit by the Great Depression, and suburbia became a choice, became a method to create employment. And that government policy favored suburbia over existing inner city. During the same period of time, National City Lines, a front company for GM, Firestone, and Standard Oil, and several other large corporations, at the same time, National City Lines, a front company for GM, Firestone, Standard Oil, and several other large corporations, bought many city transportation companies and purposefully destroyed them in favor of cars, tires, and oil. Big business has played an enormous role in the rise of suburbia and its essential partner, the automobile. In the 1920s, Pacific Electric could claim one of the world's largest public transportation systems. Big businesses with cars, oil, tires, and real estate to sell can take a lot of the credit for the demise of Pacific Electric. Futurama was an enormously popular exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. 
the exhibit model took up over an acre of interior floor space and was a remarkable promotion and preview of the automobile-dominated future we now experience. Levittown is perhaps the most iconic industrial-scale suburban development of all time. Levittown also very much benefited by federal housing policy post-World War II, and of course that federal housing policy was encouraged by business interests that had much to gain. The interstate highway system is another government program that's had enormous consequences. Right up to the present, Dwight Eisenhower appointed a Blue Ribbon Commission to study the idea of a national network of superhighways. And he appointed the chair of this Blue Ribbon Commission, who happened to be a board member of General Motors. And it's not surprising what that commission recommended. Of course, it recommended this massive public works project one picture here shows the Chrysler Freeway in Detroit completed in 1967. Many urban freeways destroyed countless inner city neighborhoods. The interstate highways also facilitated the rise of the shopping mall, which severely damaged the vitality of downtown commercial districts. Suburbia is largely a product of government policy cheered on by business interests. It's a core part of the United States economy, culture, and mythos. Tens of millions of people are employed in one way or another in service to suburbia. Suburbia and its homes, cars, infrastructure, and support systems add up to an enormous ecological footprint and we know it, yet more is built every day. The future of suburbia can go in several directions. It could become an asset. It may remain a liability. As a nation, we do have choices. Let's take a closer look. This is a Google view of my part of the neighborhood. This is River Road neighborhood in Eugene, Oregon. My property is the yellow rectangle, and the fuchsia-colored rectangles are all permaculture-friendly properties. I bought the place 20 years ago with full intentions of doing a permaculture makeover of this modest quarter-acre property. The house dates from the mid-1950s. Projects have included turning the front and backyard into garden. There's edible landscaping all over. The driveway's been removed. I've turned the garage into a living space, and there's six and a half thousand gallon rainwater storage system. There's a new accessory living structure detached from the main house. The south side patio has been turned into a passive solar space. I've had some great collaborations with my neighbors, and the, the site is an educational resource, and aesthetically, it's just a great place to be. Also important is I share the property with three other people, and this is vital for reducing the site's ecological footprint. I've used a lot of permaculture ideals and principles here on site. Permaculture is a design system for taking care of human needs in ways that are friendly to people and planet. This image is a graphic of my quarter acre property. To the right is the north, to the left is the south. In purple, that's the main house, and in in the upper left-hand corner is the accessory structure. That's my personal space. 
You can see rainwater catchment. You can see garden. There's a couple of water features. I have fruit and nut trees planted all over. You can see there's a lot of trellising. I have a lot of elevated landscaping. You can see the sunroom. You can see the garage turned into living space. This view is from the street. That's a bramble hedge all the way across the front. And where you see the opening that leads into the property, that used to be a driveway. The driveway, of course, is gone. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see essentially the same view of the house when I moved in. This view is just entering onto my property. To the left is the front yard garden, and the red indicates the remains of the driveway. You can compare in the upper right-hand corner that image, and then extending down into the larger image, that is the remains of the driveway. And you can see the door, that is where the garage used to be. Now, of course, an indoor living space. And above, you can see the bottom part of a grape arbor that is supported by 4x4s and 2x6s. And to the right, just a little bit out of sight, is a shed that's built where there used to be driveway. Let's go back in time just a little bit. This is actually the driveway removal. It's one of the first things I did when I moved on to the property. A friend and I rented a cement saw so we could make nice, clean chunks that could be reused. My friend took some and I kept some on site as the landscape features and also as a floor in my outdoor workspace. And of course, the red lines match up with other photographs that show the remains of the driveway. I'm so glad I took out the driveway. This was one of my favorite projects. Automobiles simply take up too much space. We'll hear more about pushing back on cars in a future presentation. Here we are back up to date again, and you can see the remains of the driveway. Again, that's a grape arbor up above a view of my front yard garden. And you can see some chunks kind of not very well defined in the lower right hand corner. That is my driveway that I used as a landscape features. And just off to the left is an English walnut tree I planted. And in the upper right hand corner, that's what my front yard used to look like. Another early on project was transforming the one car garage into a living space. Another awesome project. The eight foot slider is on the south side, so the space actually does have a little bit of solar input. And the view is out to the backyard. And of course, the image in the upper right hand corner, that is the before image. This is a view of the backyard when I moved in. I'm looking north, so this is towards the south side of the house. Somebody had actually closed in the patio before I bought the house. A friend and I rebuilt the solar space about 15 years ago. And on the left, you can see what looks like a gate leaning against the wall, that is where the eight-foot slider was in the previous photograph. There wasn't a lot of existing landscaping, and I took out just about everything that was here and replaced it, of course, with edible landscaping. This is a current picture of my backyard garden and the south side of the house. You can see the sun room. I've also put a gavel loom metal roof on the house. There's a fig tree on the right. There's an almond tree on the left. There's a lemon tree in between. Of course, this was all a grassy backyard.
this pathway between the main house and the accessory structure was visible in the previous photograph. I have lots of plants in the ground and I have a lot of container plants as well. Many of the plants here go into the sunroom in the wintertime. It's too cold to be outside for the banana trees. And of course in the upper right hand corner it's the same view 20 years ago. This view shows the bungalow, the accessory structure, and in the upper right hand corner that's an old shed that was removed to make room for the bungalow. And this is my space and increases the residential density of the property. So four people do live here on the property. I have a simple hoop house greenhouse on the left and that does, simple as it is, increases the length of my growing season significantly. This is inside my living space. There's a good deal of passive solar design. I wouldn't really call this necessarily a super eco-friendly house. Of course, it's all well insulated. I'd like to call it rustic modern. I designed and built most of it myself. Again, there's an aesthetic here. I really like the space. And so does my cat. From the start, I wanted to have a rainwater storage system. We have a Mediterranean climate that means dry summer. Makes a lot of sense in many ways to have a water storage system. I started with two 1600 gallon tanks and I installed those early on. And it was 15 years later when I installed the 3000 gallon tank in the upper left hand corner. Fortunately, we were able to roll the tank over my neighbor's backyard and through a section of fence we cut down and put it up on the pad. Best to install big projects early on. I really like having my rainwater storage. I use this primarily for agriculture, although the big tank is a new tank and it's food grade plastic. With a Berkey water filter, it's easy to clean this water up to drink. I actually do that. In an average year, I can pretty much take care of my garden needs with water I stored. This is not a way to save money. Water is priced so cheaply, but in terms of resilience, it's a great idea to have water storage like this. I mentioned the Galvalume metal roof that I have. Uh, it's a good fit for rainwater catchment because gavelum is the best kind of surface to catch rainwater if you're interested in drinking that water. These are three photos closely related to my place. In the upper right hand corner, I'm working with a head start group and we're filling containers with garden soil and these containers with garden soil are going to be given to school kids in the Head Start program. And on the left, I'm out and about with my housemates. That's two of my housemates right there. And then in the lower right-hand corner, that's my kitchen. I spend a good deal of time in the kitchen because I do a lot of food management. And what I'm doing at this point right here is I'm making grape juice. Several more various pictures. In the upper right hand corner, that's over my backyard fence. My new neighbors are going to be putting in a big garden and also have a big interest in permaculture. We're going to meet at some point and share some ideas. They've been over to my place to see what I'm doing. And then fava beans, compost, chicken space. Really a great outdoor workspace that I have. A lot going on here. Talk about permaculture stacking functions right here. And then, of course, here on the West Coast, this September, we've had a lot of fire. And we had a lot of ash right here in my neighborhood in Eugene. 
and this winter squash has got a lot of ash on it. My place is an educational resource. Literally thousands of people have visited over the years to see what a suburban property might look like. We've had permaculture site tours, middle school groups, ecotourism, and curious neighbors come and take a look. It's great. I love to show and tell my place. My bike is my primary transportation. I love bicycles ever since I was a kid. The upper right hand picture is the bike path into town. This is how I go into Eugene. I have two bicycle trailers depending upon the load. This particular load is frozen brambles. I'm taking the load over to a friend of mine's place and we're gonna do some jamming. The presentation titled Pushing Back on Cars will include a lot of content about bicycles, what cities are doing all over the world to push back on cars and bikes are a big part of that. A single property to do a permaculture transformation is great, but the scale of this transformation needs to be a lot larger. So these pictures show a combined effort between me and my next door neighbor. We had a laurel hedge right on the property line, and we both agreed we wanted to get rid of it and put that space to better use. So we did. Together, we took out the laurel hedge, and my neighbor replaced it with edible landscaping on his side of the fence, and I replaced my side with edible landscaping. So this is a, a great example, a small example, neighbors working together for mutual benefit. I like my neighborhood. So let's do a little show and tell of some of the highlights here in River Road. Site tours. We've been having bicycle site tours here in the neighborhood for 15 or 18 years. This has been going on for a long time. So we meet in a particular location and we go visit properties and typically Whoever lives at that property is there to describe, explain what they're doing. This is a great opportunity for people to share what they're learning. I know for a fact many people have become far more ambitious with their properties after they've been on a site tour. My next door neighbor, Bill, had his gravel driveway dug out with a bobcat and replaced with garden soil. So where he used to have a driveway, now he has a garden. Several pictures in the neighborhood. One friend is making use of the property next door for a garden. We have a small urban, suburban community supported agriculture in another part of the neighborhood. Ethan has a beautiful cob greenhouse. Wow, it's really artistic. And then my friend Sandra's backyard. This is only part of her backyard, so she's done a great job in transforming her place for food, aesthetics, tiny home, greenhouse, water catchment. My good luck when Ravi and Michelle moved in just a year after I did, and they have a slightly larger property, built a thousand square foot straw bale structure in their backyard, which has been the site of all kinds of wonderful community events, like educational, social events, celebrations of different kinds, permaculture trainings, one year, the city of Eugene hosted the annual National Neighborhoods USA Conference. That meant people from all over the country involved with their neighborhood associations met in Eugene to compare notes. And the hosting city 
puts on different kinds of tours for the guests from out of town. So we hosted a tour here in our neighborhood. And we took people from Birmingham, Roanoke, Virginia, all over the place around our neighborhood to see the permaculture we're doing in our neighborhood. And we finished the tour with this big dinner in the backyard there at Dharmalaya at Ravi and Michelle's place. This was a great chance to show and tell our permaculture neighborhood with people from out of town. And many of them have never seen anything like what we're doing here. Another important location just a couple blocks away from my house is Vistara. And this is a one acre property. It's a long, narrow rectangle. I love the idea of taking something that isn't really performing very well and making it perform a whole lot better. And this property here is a good example of that. It was covered in blackberries that was just totally unused. And now there's a huge garden. It's kind of a little micro eco village. We've had a variety of community events here over the years, celebrations, harvest festival, and educational events as well. When I moved into my neighborhood, I had never heard the term neighborhood association, but I was drafted onto the board of our neighborhood association when I moved here, and it's been one of the most enriching experiences of my life. A neighborhood association exists to address the issues in the neighborhood. It's entirely volunteer People involved with the Neighborhood Association set the agenda. This is the base of the Civic Pyramid. So I'll talk more about Neighborhood Associations in the next presentation, which is Allies and Assets. In the Pacific Northwest, we alternate states for the regional permaculture convergence. Uh, Washington State will host the Convergence one year. Oregon will host the Convergence the alternating years. So we hosted a regional suburban permaculture convergence here in River Road in our suburban neighborhood, and it was an awesome event. We have a rec center in the neighborhood, and this is where we had the event people from out of town camped in people's backyards. We had site tours, we had plenary sessions, different kinds of workshops. We had the outdoor expo, which was free to the public. Inside, you had to pay a little bit to go to the workshops and plenary sessions and the meals, but we wanted much of the convergence to be free and open to the public, and we estimate Maybe seven, eight hundred people participated in one way or another, a suburban permaculture convergence. You can see the image, the view from up above, areas adopted in the River Road Greenway. The Willamette River is the east side of our neighborhood, and it's one of the most important resources that we have here in the neighborhood. The Greenway is public property, and residents of the neighborhood, myself included, have adopted certain areas along the Greenway. The city doesn't have the personnel or the budget to do as much work in the Greenway as what the Greenway needs to restore habitat. We've had meetings with the city to create action plans, and we've had untold work parties to restore habitat, work in the Filbert Grove, and more. Almost any neighborhood has some place, some location, some kind of need that can bring people together and common cause to build community, to build resilience. The Greenway is an important place in our neighborhood for doing that. That's a short look at our neighborhood. I just love the involvement. We've got so many good people in the neighborhood. There's so much work to do. So 
let's conclude this part of the presentation about transforming a suburban property and this little small amount about the neighborhood. So let's have some final thoughts and following final thoughts. I'd like to share a little overview of the remaining six presentations planned. Transforming this suburban property has been one of the most creative and rewarding projects in my life. There are many benefits. For the thousands of people who have visited over the years, it's a preview of a preferred future. For me, it's the present. Transforming this property is a significant pushback on market capitalism because I can take care of certain important needs here on site without involvement with the mainstream economy like food, energy, water. Half of all Americans live in suburbia and many of those suburban properties and residents have exactly the same opportunities I've had here. It's very much a matter of how we prioritize our time and money. It's a blessing to see the changing seasons here. I love to see the birds, the snakes, the spiders, the wildlife. They are all welcome. I'm excited to see how my new neighbors transform their property. And I look forward to more show and tell. Okay, let's take a few minutes to have a look at future presentations in this series. Moving towards a healthy society, economy, and planet. Here's a quick look at the remaining six presentations in the series. You can pause to take a closer look. You can do a screen save. You could also pass this information on to friends you know who would be interested. There's an enormous amount of thought-provoking and practical information contained in these presentations. Please forward the info to others. I'd appreciate it tons. Thanks. A bit more information about the presentations. This is the Zoom information. The Zoom info to attend every one of these presentations is the same. You can use the same info to access every presentation. And every presentation will find its way to YouTube, my YouTube channel, which is indicated here. Almost any city or town has more allies and assets for creating actions than most people realize. This presentation will describe quite a few that surprisingly you might find in your own town. What might a one earth lifestyle look like? It's hard to say exactly, but we can actually gain a pretty good idea. And you can be sure it's a lot different from what the average American expects. This presentation is based on the footprint calculator. This presentation is all about taboo topics, using less, downsizing our lifestyles. There are many benefits to be gained. Market capitalism has a lot of baggage. We've lived for that baggage our entire lives. We're so used to it, we don't even recognize it. It's social, environmental, political, and economic. There are healthy alternatives, and those alternatives range in scale from our own lives to the neighborhood, the community, and beyond. Pushing back on cars is a fascinating topic. More and more cities all over the world are doing exactly that. It's exciting to see the variety, the creativity, the approaches all over the world to pushing back on cars. We'll take a good look. 
the preferred future will be very different. Our shelter, our transportation, our food choices, our recreation. All the presentations in this series are about a preferred future. On November 18th, we'll have a look at quite a variety of creative approaches for moving towards a healthy society, economy, and planet. System change is an enormous task. We'll either accomplish it or we'll wish we had. No matter what, the more people involved, the better. As indicated above, we have lots of assets, lots of allies, lots of actions. Imagine what we could do if they were all in sync with each other. Because they are addressing one problem or another caused by market capitalism. We're all on the same team. Join us December 3rd to find out more.